This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Samantha Bennett with the K-State Radio Network. We begin this week's programming with an impactful two-part program providing information on the implications of the recent listing decision for the Lesser Prairie Chicken. Joining Agriculture Today for this conversation is K-State Wildlife Extension Specialist Drew Ricketts. Part one provides background on the significance of the lesser prairie chicken and their habitat needs. We continue our conversation on the lesser prairie chicken with Drew providing detailed information on what the threatened status of the species really means for western Kansas producers. He explains what take means and where it applies in Kansas, as well as what a grazing plan is and who can write one. We end with K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook highlighting that as more states consider legislation regarding wages for hourly employees, producers may need to prepare for potential increases in labor costs. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. We are joined now by Drew Ricketts, our K-State Wildlife Specialist, for a very special wildlife segment for this week. But Drew, first and foremost, thank you for coming in today because this was a heavy ask. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm glad to do it. This uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken listing has some important implications for Kansas broadly and also especially for our producers. So I, I'm glad to get this information out. Absolutely. And you beat me to it, introducing our topic, which Sorry. is fine. That's okay. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about the Lesser Prairie Chicken and some legislation changes, some listing changes have some producers concerned. So hopefully today we're going to address those. Yeah. Wonderful. So Let's first and foremost start, Drew, with what is a lesser prairie chicken for those that maybe aren't familiar? Sure, sure. So lesser prairie chickens are a species of prairie grouse. There's several different species of grouse, and a few of those are ones that are specific to living in the prairie. They are what we call a prairie obligate species, which basically means they can't exist without prairie. They also need relatively big chunks of prairie, so we think of them as sort of being a big landscape bird. And when we manage for a critter like this, we manage on a landscape scale. So just some examples of how much prairie they might need. Thinking on a smaller scale, within one mile, we would need about 60% grassland cover within that one mile in order to have enough for that small spot to be occupied by a lesser prairie chicken from a broader perspective, ideally uh, 70% of a 30 square mile area would be grassland. There also needs to be a fair bit of heterogeneity within that grassland cover. And that's a word that we use a lot as biologists, but basically it means that there's a mix of different cover types on the landscape. So for lecking, which is the mating ritual or the dancing that they do in the springtime that everybody sees the cool videos of. They need areas of very short grass. Uh, They like those, if possible, to be at higher elevation points on the landscape so they can be seen from a long ways. Um, For nesting, they need areas with relatively dense cover, so it'd be hard to see through. And that cover is going to be 13 to 30 inches tall, or an easy way to think about that would be like shin to hip height. And that's going to be the nesting cover. In most of the areas occupied by lesser prairie chickens in Kansas, that cover is going to be provided by tall grass species. In other parts of their range, it might be provided by sagebrush or a shrub oak called sand shinery oak. And then for the brooding period, when they're raising their chicks, they need these areas that are relatively open at the ground level but have sort of a canopy of broadleaf plants above. So that canopy is going to provide protection, and those broadleaf plants are going to provide food. They're also going to, most importantly, from a food standpoint, provide cover and habitat for soft-bodied arthropods, which are really the most important food source for those chicks when they're growing. Sort of the last thing about their habitat requirements is they avoid vertical structures, including trees. And this is one of those things that can be especially detrimental to the species. And it's most pronounced during the nesting season. But to think about what we mean by avoiding structures, more than one tree per acre is really too many for lesser prairie chickens to want to be in an area. And areas with zero trees per acre are 40 times more likely to be used than areas with five trees per acre. So that just sort of puts that into perspective for us. So obviously the species of bird are very particular about their habitat. Yeah, they sure are. And they, they really want, they want to have good cover to hide in and they want to avoid potential habitat for predators which makes sense completely. And 
Drew, we are talking about the needs of these lesser prairie chickens because, like I mentioned before, there's been a change in how they're listed. So before they were kind of listed as imperiled was the word that was used. Now they're known to be threatened or endangered in some areas, and that is where it's led to some concern. So we've kind of talked through the needs of lesser prairie chickens, but Let's talk a little bit about their significance. They're known as an umbrella species, as well as an indicator species, and also a boom bust species. <laughs> so there's a lot of different needs for these animals. Why is that? Yeah. So the classification as an umbrella species relates back to how many different habitat requirements they have. In wildlife management, uh, we refer to species whose habitat requirements encompass the requirements of a bunch of other species as an umbrella species. So basically the needs for, um, let's say, horned larks and other species of birds or critters that are going to be in western Kansas are all included within the many things that a, a lesser prairie chicken needs to thrive. They're an indicator species because they need that good intact land cover and that includes heterogeneity that's representative of healthy prairie. So if they're present, it means that it's basically a healthy ecosystem, at least at the local scale. And and the boom-bust population dynamics basically refers to the fact that sometimes this species does really well and sometimes it does really poorly all in the same places. And that's mostly driven by uh, annual variation in precipitation. So this species can can really bust because of poor uh, nest success and chick survival during droughts or even when there's too much rain. So they kind of need the right amount of precipitation. So some challenges that they face in Kansas specifically where a lot of this prairie land that they exist in happens to be. Sure. So we have talked about how these lesser prairie chickens have gone from imperiled to threatened or endangered. How did there go from being a few million of these birds to now we're thinking in the thousands of what is left? Sure, sure. So basically when we homesteaded, so in Kansas that occurred in 1862, folks figured out how to make a living on the landscape, right? They couldn't stay there if they couldn't make a living from it. And one of those ways was through cultivating it for row crop agriculture production. That's basically an immediate loss of habitat for this bird. Other ways are through altered disturbance regimes. So we don't have huge herds of bison roaming across the landscape and denuding it. And the fires that also attracted those bison to the areas. We don't have fire in a lot of Kansas anymore. So that's led to some woody encroachment. So that gets at the the vertical structures, one tree per acre being too many or more than one tree per acre being too many, and then development. So energy and communications infrastructure, so oil and gas development, wind turbines, smaller windmills that are for pumping water, cell towers, electric poles, and those sorts of things. So as you mentioned, you know, Historically, the estimate is that at one time, Texas alone supported 2 million birds of this species prior to 1900. Now, in the last 10 years, population has varied between 17,000 and 36,000 birds of this species. So we currently, in November, uh, this bird was listed under the Endangered Species Act, and there are two distinct population segments. So the southern distinct population segment, which is all the the area in New Mexico that's occupied by this species, and also a small portion of the occupied range in northwest Texas, in that area they're listed as endangered. So that's basically as imperiled as you could be. In the rest of the Texas panhandle, Oklahoma, eastern Colorado, and Kansas, where these birds exist, they are listed as threatened. And there's a 4D rule along with that listing that acknowledges that in order to maintain them, there may be some things that happen that every once in a while create a loss of a few individuals of this bird. Sure. So we are going to talk through what those 4D rules really are and what they include. And one of the phrases that will commonly come up in this conversation, I feel like, is called take. So as we get into 4D and we start talking about take, let's go ahead and define some of these things so that producers are like, ah, I'm trying to keep up with all this dialogue. Let's let's keep things in track. Yeah. So this is one of those things that I'm actually just going to read because I don't want to exclude anything. This is this is legal language. So take as defined under the Endangered Species Act is to harm, harass, pursue, hunt, shoot, wound, kill, trap, capture, or collect, or attempt to engage in any such conduct. 
And really the two most important words in that sentence that I just read for producers are going to be harm or harass. So harm is further defined by the Fish and Wildlife Service to include significant habitat modification or degradation that results in death or injury to the listed species by significantly impairing behavioral patterns such as breeding, feeding, or sheltering. Harass is defined by the Fish and Wildlife Service as actions that create the likelihood of injury to a listed species to such an extent as to significantly disrupt normal behavior patterns, which include but are not limited to breeding, feeding, or sheltering. And basically, the species is protected from take wherever it occurs. When we talk about most of what we're talking about today, we're going to refer to things like habitat versus non-habitat. We also are talking about the range where this bird occurs. So the challenge with this is that if somehow a lesser prairie chicken ended up in Iowa and somebody shot it, they would still be in violation of the Endangered Species Act, even though that area is not part of the bird's range. And it sounds weird to talk about with the lesser prairie chicken, but it is something that we do encounter with species like wolves every once in a while. So it's important to clarify that, I think. Sure, yeah. Lesser prairie chickens might not travel as far as a wolf pack would, per se, but still something to be wary of for sure. And when we talk about take, I think it's important to outline that this applies, like you said, if if lesser prairie chicken was to be anywhere, it'll apply there. But it also applies to a select area of land that has been outlined in these conservation maps. So let's talk about what these conservation maps are, the areas that they cover really, western Kansas being a broad area that is covered, but also what really applies here. Because I think, you know, people just heard the list of all that take includes and are like, whoa, what is going on? You know what I mean? It's it's alarming almost. People feel threatened in some areas in terms of what they can and can't do. But let's go ahead and outline what that really means. Yeah. So if we're referring specifically to Kansas, um, the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range occupies portions of basically the western third of the state. So if you own land or are conducting activities that could result in take of a Lesser Prairie Chicken in the western third of Kansas, then I think it's important to look at some of the maps and resources that we're going to talk about so that you know whether or not you're included in that area. When we think about take and considering whether or not your actions might be considered take, it would not be take to, let's say, break out prairie or break out an expired tract of CRP that is grass that is lesser prairie chicken habitat if it's outside of that occupied range of lesser prairie chickens, even if it's in western Kansas. Mm -hmm. So we, we pretty well know where they're at, right? So if we're thinking about actions that might qualify as incidental take, those actions are going to be specific to a parcel. Are there chickens there or not? That's going to be like number one. If you know that there are lesser prairie chickens present on your land or your neighbor's land, then you need to be careful. Sure. And Drew, I'm going to interrupt you because this is not cultivated land we're referring to. Cultivated land in these situations already, you know, commercial farming per se, acres that are already being planted on safe, right, in these cases? Sure. So cultivated land would be covered under normal agricultural practices. Yep. So we can still apply the normal herbicides that we normally do for normal agriculture. We can use whatever tillage practices we normally do and all those sorts of things. So that land is considered non-habitat because it is actively being farmed. So that area would not be included under take because it's non-habitat. Even if it is in that map area that shows. Exactly. Sure. You can keep farming. Yep. Um, and I think that, that there has been some discussion about EPA restrictions on certain herbicides and that sort of thing that may be applied like for corn production, like I think atrazine or Parquat, maybe I heard, heard some of those in a previous radio program. So it is not the intent of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to restrict the use of those products on tilled land. The challenge with pesticide application becomes if we're thinking about weed control in non-cultivated land, so range land that is definitely habitat for this species. Under those sorts of restrictions, we would not want to exclude, the Fish and Wildlife Service does not want to exclude control of invasive species. That's typically done in a spot spraying application, right? Right. 
what might be controlled, though, would be the use of a broad-spectrum herbicide that's applied across an entire pasture. Sure. Uh, sometimes that's done. I've heard the term native weeds used. And sometimes we, we would apply a broad-spectrum herbicide like 2,4-D to try and reduce broadleaf plant abundance and favor grass. That, if done in an area that's included in the Lesser Prairie Chicken Range on rangeland, could be considered take. Mm-hmm. So that's something to be careful about. Absolutely. And when we're thinking about these rangelands, it's important to highlight that this is the habitat that lesser prairie chickens thrive in, but it's also habitat that's often grazed, which allows for these species to thrive even better. Exactly. So the Fish and Wildlife Service recognizes that if if we weren't producing cattle on those rangelands or sheep or goats, that those rangelands would be used for another purpose and that they would no longer likely be maintained as prairie. And that's critical for the lesser prairie chicken. Also, the act of grazing by cattle creates plant diversity. And it also creates some of that heterogeneity that we talked about if it's done in certain ways. So grazing is a critical part of the existence of lesser prairie chickens, for sure in Kansas, but within most of their range. And so that's what a big part of this 4D rule is about. So that 4D rule acknowledges that there's going to be some take. It's designed to avoid take, but it acknowledges that there may be some take at a small scale to do things that are going to favor the species. Which is what you referred to as incidental take earlier. Yes. So non-incidental take would be intentional take like hunting, right? If we were hunting lesser prairie chickens and intentionally shot one, then that would be tried and true take, right? But a lot of times when we're referring to things that inadvertently resulted in the death of a threatened or endangered species, like a cow stepping on a lesser prairie chicken nest or a producer checking cattle accidentally running over a lesser prairie chicken nest. Those would be incidental take because they're they're by accident, mm-hmm. but they're still take. Good to outline those differences for sure, just to once again set some definitions for producers that are concerned. Yeah. And we've talked through some of these examples already of take, what might cause for take to be put in place. But let's go through a few more. So breaking out grass in these areas. So, you know, tilling new areas or expanding that cropland. That would be an example of you probably won't be able to do this anymore. It's definitely an example of something that the producer needs to reach out to the local um, environmental service office or ecological service office of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and consult with them about whether or not it is take. Because it may not be if they're not in an area that is included under all the parameters of habitat. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we need to think about, so that I assume that you were referring to breaking out native prairie that's not been tilled. Yes. You said that. Mm -hmm. The other thing we need to think about is expired CRP grass, because that's a really important component of nesting cover for lesser prairie chickens in the area where they're most abundant. So expired CRP that has been cropland within the last five years would be included under normal agricultural practices and most likely could be broken back out and would not be considered incidental take in that way. When I was asking all these questions to my contact with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, he was unclear about CRP that's no longer under contract that hasn't been tilled in more than five years. And so that's that's an area that they're going to clarify. If anybody is within the lesser prairie chicken range that is considering breaking out CRP that's expired and hasn't been tilled in the last five years, then they really should reach out to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and get clarification on that. Absolutely. Always a good idea just to ask before rather than asking for forgiveness in these cases because there are some serious parameters put in place. Sure. And Drew, moving on here, I think, you know, the number one thing that the phrase that was thrown around was grazing plans. And that producers are like, I don't know what this means. I've never had a grazing plan in place if they've never been a part of some of these programs before. It's been of concern for a lot of people. So let's talk about what these grazing plans are and how they fall under this 4D rule. Sure. So one of the provisions of the 4D rule is that if there is a grazing plan in place that has been approved by an approved plan developer, then we are entirely covered for incidental take. So what that would mean is we don't have to worry about 
ramifications if we did accidentally run over a lesser prairie chicken nest when we're checking cattle and those sorts of things. There has been a lot of potentially misconceptions and I think misunderstandings about what these plans are and what they aren't, and also who can develop plans and who can't. Basically, anybody who's going to develop a plan must be approved by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a developer. The process for that is something we can put a link to that process in the show notes, but basically anybody who wishes to be considered clicks that link, they fill out the application, they talk about you know the things that they've done that they think would allow them to write a good plan, and then the Fish and Wildlife Service is going to consider whether or not that person will be approved or not. These plans are not range management plans. They are basically a regulatory requirement to meet the 4D exemption. They have to consider things like soils, past management of that particular parcel, precipitation in the area. Plans need to include measures for dealing with drought and these sorts of things. It's not a prairie chicken grazing plan. It's not a range management plan. It is a plan to meet this 4D exemption. So it's kind of something that we've never dealt with before. Sure. But I think the key here is to let producers know that they don't need to reach out to someone that's in a conservation group or specifically or anything. If they are a producer that has experience in, you know, managing this land and have years of experience, they themselves can apply. And this is something that they themselves can readily do. Yes. And that was the guidance that I received from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. They recommended that any producer who has been Grazing cattle for very long in western Kansas likely qualifies as someone who should be an approved plan developer and should apply. There have been questions about who, from a public agency standpoint, might be available to help develop these plans. Uh, Currently, Wildlife and Parks is not considering becoming plan developers. It's possible that could change in the future, but the the current plans are not to. NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Agency, is currently assessing with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and internally whether or not it makes sense for them to become plan developers. So the caveat to that is that NRCS, within their agency, they've sort of got different duties, right? A, a, a range conservationist would have different things that they do. Part of those duties is implementing programs. So that would be implementing things like EQIP, conservation stewardship program, and those sorts of things. If a producer is enrolled in one of those conservation programs, then I've been told that they can have assurance that grazing plans either currently in existence or that will be made in the future under that conservation program will meet the 4D exemption. What they're trying to decide is, should their folks in the field become certified to be plan developers on an individual property basis just for the purpose of developing plans? That makes sense for sure. And, you know, I think we'll probably do a follow-up segment to this probably in the future as questions potentially come in. So if anybody's tuning in and they continue to have questions, well, I think I want to embark on creating my own grazing plan. Maybe we'll pull some experts to kind of advise what should be on that grazing plan. You can help with that, I'm sure, Drew. So that might be something we continue to discuss here in the future. But Drew, in the meantime, before we get to that, if in the future people are looking for more information on what to expect from this change... Where can they find that at? I think the best resources for that are going to be through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And there's probably too many links for me to just rattle them off my head right now. But folks that they can reach out to immediately are me, their local contacts with Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks, their extension agents, if they have contacts with NRCS and those sorts of things. Those are all good resources. And then we'll we'll put a bunch of web links in the show notes, too, that folks can look at. One thing that we didn't say about the grazing management plans that I did want to say is that if someone is approved as a developer, they are not obligated to write plans for others. They are approved to develop plans, and they can just use that approval to develop their own plans. There is a list of plan developers that will be provided, but you can choose to be anonymous on that list, so your information would be excluded from it. The caveat to that is that it's still discoverable under the Freedom of Information Act, so it's possible that a news organization or or some other organization could submit a claim under FOIA 
and gain access to that information of who the approved plan developers are, even if you wanted to be anonymous. Sure. Something just to keep in mind, just in case, not saying it will happen for sure, but just something to keep in mind. But Drew, I know we've talked through a lot today. Hopefully we've answered a lot of people's questions, whether that's, you know, ag extension agents out there that are getting questions about this or even producers themselves that are still kind of like, I don't know what's going on. Hopefully we've covered a lot of it today. I'm very appreciative of all the research you've done to help us with this conversation. So thank you so much for your time today. Of course. I'm glad to do it. As always, thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Once again, that was Drew Ricketts. He is our K-State Wildlife Specialist. Joining us for a conversation on the lesser prairie chicken. We'll be back with more ahead on Agriculture Today. This is Agriculture Today. Along with Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. In this week's Milk Lines, as more states consider legislation regarding wages for hourly employees, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook encourages producers to look for ways to increase efficiencies on the farm to reduce the time it takes to complete daily tasks. Today I'd like to visit with our Kansas dairy producers concerning labor costs and where we might be headed in the future. You know, as you read reports from around the United States, other states are looking at different ways to implement laws that would dictate at what point do we start paying overtime after so many hours each week and how that would impact agriculture. In agriculture, we typically look at work weeks that are anywhere from about 50 to 70 hours per worker per employee. As we think about that and we think about dairy farms and we recognize that people that are employed on dairy farms do put in a significant number of hours every week. Some of our employees on our farms are on basically salaried positions, so hours aren't really counted that way. They're compensated fairly based on the number of hours that they actually put in, but there are different expectations for those jobs. However, bulk of our labor on dairy farms is actually paid by the hour. So here in Kansas, should something like this be implemented, like it's being implemented in other states, it would affect our labor cost. So how are you going to react to that as a dairy farmer? Well, I would encourage you to, number one, be proactive. Make sure you're treating all your employees fairly. And if we're not implementing some sort of overtime pay at the present, might be something we might want to think about as managers and owners in the future. Now, obviously, if we increase wages, which we have in the last few years, we somehow have to find efficiencies around the dairy. This is really where I want you to be proactive and think about how you might do things differently on your dairy farm. You know, when we look at the number of cows cared for per employee on our dairy, it has always amazed me that this number doesn't change significant year to year or even sometimes decade to decade. Many times when we look at those numbers across a variety of dairies, we're still looking at somewhere around 60 to 80 cows per employee, depending on what kinds of efficiencies we have on our dairy and depending on what all that includes. On larger dairies, it's easier for us to separate out those things that are associated with the dairy versus those things that are associated with, say, grazing crops, disposing of manure nutrients, etc. Maybe even things like maintenance would be something that we could exclude in some of those calculations to increase the number of cows cared for per employee. But whatever the number is for your dairy, take some time to look at how you would gain efficiencies. Here's an example, loading the feed wagon. As you watch one of your employees load the feed wagon, how many trips do they make back and forth between the silage bag and the wagon? Maybe something simple would save some trips and save some time. You know, a lot of times we're delivering maybe 10 or 12 loads of feed each day on our dairies. So if we can save even five minutes per load and how we load the load, that adds up to maybe as much as an hour each day. And over time, that's very, very important. So maybe you need a larger bucket on the end of that front end loader. For the forages and a different bucket that you use for things like concentrates, as you look at your milking procedures and the number of people you have involved around the milking parlor, are there ways to increase the efficiency? Are there things that are taking too much time? You know, sometimes it's just 
some simple things on facility design, maybe some gates that need to be fixed so it doesn't take quite as much time to move animals back and forth, or maybe some gates that need to be added, or maybe an extra lane to move animals back and forth more efficiently. Sometimes we need to look at technology. Maybe there are pieces of technology that we need to employ on our dairy that would reduce the number of hours it takes to get certain tasks done. So as you look at labor cost, it's important to make sure that you treat your employees fairly. And in doing that, you need to look for ways to improve on your labor efficiency. That way, when we're faced with increases in the cost per hour for labor, it does not have the same impact on our bottom line. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension. Thanks, Mike. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. For Samantha Bennett, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.